So our next speaker is Forrest Leinbarger, and he, uh, for decades, he's been committed <clears throat> to sustainable design and building, and he is nationally known for his design of zero energy homes and green roofs and innovation, creating healthy indoor air environments. Take it away, Forrest. Thank you, Chris. That was a great program and sort of went over all the uh, details, so I don't have to. And I use Dr. Bronner's. Just don't ever read the label. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key. So let me tell you uh, a little bit uh, about uh, myself. I own Inhabiture. We have a, a sustainable furniture store in downtown Palo Alto, over on Hamilton and Ramona. We also do uh, um, we design buildings and the environs around them, and that's how we sort of got into the gray water and water water use portion of, of this work was sort of looking at holistic sustainable design and that sort of led us down the road of how do we create environments in totality that really uh, work with uh, uh, work with our environment in California <clears throat> and what I want to do <clears throat> what I wanted to uh, Uh, I think we go up to slideshow. Oh, uh, while they're sorting that out, one thing I forgot to mention, and I think everyone knows, but there's a sign-up sheet. If you want to participate in a hands-on gray water workshop, please sign up on one of the sign-up sheets in the back, and we will contact you. And you can either be at your home, or you could be at someone else's home and learn how to Keep going down a little farther. A little farther, one more, and that's it. All right. So let's move right on past this one. And uh, do you have the little, uh, I think we need to move the uh, point clicker. Okay. Aha. Yay. So I was fortunate enough to have done the first gray water system after the 2009 code change. Uh, those of us who were working on the advocacy at the time uh, had about a month run up uh, as to when the code was going to be released, so we were able to do one the very next day after this code, uh, <laughs> code was passed, and we did a laundry landscape system for that, uh, which is a fabulous system, no permits, easy to do. I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly on uh, gray water and on water resources um, and our water use and how it fits in sort of with our overall sustainability and particularly how it applies to California. <coughs> um, I thought I would start with uh, talking about uh, why, why do we even bother. Of course, I'm talking to the converted here, but uh, <laughs> we like to talk to amongst ourselves. <laughs> Uh, and then I'll go into the more complex gray water systems and how they, uh, how they work. And uh, I'll also look at some other water conservation methods because I think you get some real synergies out of, uh, out of water use when you start to not looking, uh, stop looking very narrowly at it and start looking at supply and demand together. You really find some wonderful things can happen. And uh, the beautiful thing about sustainability is uh, looking at uh, all the opportunities it affords as opposed to uh, thinking about it as restrictions on our lifestyle. <clears throat> so, now let's talk about the bad things. So, of course, I think we all know we're in one of the worst droughts ever. Um, we have our CR snowpack after this year was 18% of normal. Um, and... Uh, we're following that on the last two years, 2003, 2013-2012, also horrible drought years. So we're now on, uh, perhaps I was barely around in the 70s when we had the, that bad drought, but it seems like we're now in a, maybe a worse drought than, that, than the 1970s drought that we were, uh, that California went through. <clears throat> the larger issue, of course, is 
global warming is uh, leading to, the Sierra snowpack is very fragile. It's just a, uh, within a few degrees of uh, that, uh, be from snow to, to water, so uh, uh, within freezing. So what we're finding is projections show that uh, our water use is going to be drastically reduced here, and we're really going to need to be thinking sensibly about water in the future. Um, here we're looking at between 2020 and 2049 projections of 25 to 40 percent uh, Sierra snowpack loss. That's the major water supply. 50 percent of the water in Santa Clara County comes from uh, from the Hetchetchee, which is uh, Sierra snowpack. <clears throat> Uh, and then when we look on a little farther into the future, up to 2070, 2099, we're seeing almost the complete loss of the Sierra snowpack. So uh, that's why we care, or one of the reasons we care. <clears throat> but we've got the best, best opportunity here. Uh, if you look at our water use, we use a lot of water compared to other countries. Um, and so we have a lot of opportunity to use water. And I love using water twice. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't disappear after the first time you use it. So uh, using it again in creative ways is so wonderful. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about uh, uh, native plants and being careful with uh, which ones you use. Well, riparian native plants are wonderful. Um, I love using riparian native plants along with uh, gray water because they offer so much uh, habitat uh, for native species. And it's really it's just a wonderful opportunity to support our uh, local ecosystems. <clears throat> so let's go, well, I think we already defined gray water pretty well. Uh, so I'm going to move right on. This is an example of, uh, so of uh, how we might uh, think about a, a system that would be more complex. So now instead of just looking at laundry, I'm also going to be talking about sinks and showers and uh, not toilets, bad toilet, um, <laughs> sinks and showers <clears throat> and uh, um, bathtubs, other things like that. <clears throat> this is kind of a way to break this apart. So what we were talking about uh, this is maybe a, for a typical household. Uh, our laundry system might be 30 gallons a day. This really depends on, uh, you can make these calculations, sing all sorts of songs, but roughly proportionate, this would be the laundry system. What we'll be talking about with more complex systems is this area in blue, uh, over this 80 gallons. Uh, this would be our black water. Who knows what that red is? It's miscellaneous. <coughs> So I'm going to talk about the, the code defines two other kinds of gray water systems. So we've got the laundry to landscape system that's, that's permit free, but it also talks about a branch system. And these systems are very easy to install. They're very robust as well. Uh, they still do not store water. They still do not uh, um, pump water. But what they do is they do accept water from showers, vanities, utility sinks, non-food sinks, all sorts of things, that area that made up that large blue wedge. So a branch system makes a lot of sense as well. It does require a permit. It does fit into the codes. Um, fortunately, most of our, jur our uh, jurisdictions around here, our municipalities, have come... Uh, come around to the benefits of gray water. We're not seeing a lot of trouble implementing these systems. Um, and these systems are really quite effective. We tend to do them a little differently than our plumbing system. Our plumbing system tends to concentrate all the water together and move it into one place. When we're doing these branch systems, we're working with gravity and we're trying, we're usually thinking about distributed systems using water right near where it's being produced. So that instead of trying to bring all the water together into one great massive system, we're just keeping it distributed, using it right where the, oh, there's the master bath, let's just use that water right there. Oh, there's the, uh, there's the laundry, let's use that water over there. There's the other bathroom, let's use that water over in that, part of, uh, over in that yard over there. So we're usually thinking about the geography a little more carefully. Um, because we don't have the pumps. The laundry system has that pump built right into it, and that gives you a little longer reach. So we're usually using that for the area that's hardest to reach, and distributed system for these branch systems work really well. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details on how they're done, but it's not that different than the system that you just uh, heard talk, talked about. <clears throat> complex gray water systems, that's the name of them, complex. 
They're not actually as complex as they sound, um, but they do provide uh, some great benefits. Uh, you can store water. Now, my experience uh, with gray water is yeah, don't store it. <laughs> uh, if you want, filter it, and then it's no longer, or excuse me, treat it, and then it's no longer gray water, and then you can store it all you want. <laughs> so a lot of the times in the systems that we build, we'll just start right, right away with filtering and, and treating it and having it run through, usually a biological system. This looks like it's some kind of mechanical system. What this really is, is this is a screen, this is a sand filter in this system. We use those, but more often we create bioswales and we create, uh, um, and we create basins where there'll be an a, a environment that will treat the water. We'll then move it right into storage after that if we're going to store it at all and uh, that tends to work really, really well. <clears throat> they usually have pumps. Pumps tend to be pretty robust. Filters tend to be not so robust. So we usually avoid filtration systems entirely, and we go to these bioremedial treatments, and, uh, and, then we go, and then pumps tend to be a pretty robust system because filters do clog, and they do tend to be the weak point in this kind of system. In this system, we are then often concentrating water again because of this bioremedial nature and this uh, pumping methodology. So these then often tend to congregate the water together and then distribute. <clears throat> but once you sort of walk down that road, then you have every opportunity available to you. You can now irrigate your lawn, which tends to use maybe 25 or 30 percent of all the water in a typical California house. So landscape tends to use about 50 percent. In most of our houses, that we use a lot of lawn, and lawn's the biggest user of water. So you tend to see 25, 30 percent of that irrigation water used for lawns. So this does allow it to be used for that, although removing some of that lawn and getting those tax credits is also a great idea. Um, <clears throat> So, synergies. Uh, we were talking about how many outlets you can use in a gray water system. Well, my experience with uh, native plants is if you give them no, even drought resistant ones, if you give them no water, they tend to look a little gangly and a little mangy. And I tend to like to make systems that give them some water so that they look full and rich and uh, continue to grow and thrive. <clears throat> so, you can do a lot of uh, work with uh, gray water systems. We use a lot of, uh, we'll often use gravel bed to distribute water in a gray water system. So we'll often start maybe with a, with a basin, but then we'll do a longer distribution method with a little underground gravel trail, and that will tend to bring water around to larger areas so we can give, we can take less water and go farther with it. And then we have the plants, native plants tend to be pretty good at reaching out and getting water, finding water resources, and they can still, they can reach pretty far to get to those, those uh, gravel trenches and, in, uh, and, and into those mulch basins. So we tend to use them together. We tend to get this great synergy. We've been able to make lots and lots of houses that just use no irrigation water whatsoever. <clears throat> also, you know, when you're thinking about this, we're going to be wanting to think about our supply of water. Yeah, it's great to use the water twice, but we are in California. We've got these drought conditions. Where we have the biggest problems with global warming. So let's, and we saw how much water Americans use. So I often think, let's make an efficient system, but then also make an, a great water system is great, but also look at your other ways to save water. So I'm going to make a little plug for water conservation. <clears throat> Showers use 18% of our water. Typically, um, mostly uh, teenage girls, but uh, probably some of the rest of us as well. We seem to have forgotten somewhere along the lines how to shut off the water when we soap up and then turn it back on. That's a good thing. But uh, low flow shower heads have come a long way as well. So 1.5 uh, 1 or even 1.0 shower heads, those really save a lot of water and also a lot of energy because it's hot water coming out of those. So you get a double double bang for your buck. <clears throat> and the front loader washers, we talked to that one to death, so I'll keep going. <clears throat> uh, here's a little lovely thing I love. I think it's wonderful. And this is a this is an all-in-one gray water system. This is a <clears throat> but it scares a lot of people. So <laughs> I'm here to teach you about it. <laughs> so the water that comes, so you flush the toilet, 
And water comes out of that little spout. And people always wonder what's going on there. Because uh, I have one of these in my house, so I know people wonder, and they talk. But what's happening is the supply for the tank, the fresh water, is coming into the sink. So you wash your hands after uh, you wash your hands in the fresh water that's coming in to resupply the toilet. So that soapy water that comes off of your hands, that's what goes into the tank. Uh, these are really nice systems. Um, and toilets use a lot of water. These are also extremely hygienic the opposite of your first impression when you look at it, because you don't have to turn on or turn off any faucets while your hands are dirty. So as soon as you flush the toilet, then you're, this automatically turns on, you wash your hands, you never turn it off, because when the toilet's full, it'll automatically shut off. So these are actually the opposite of being unhygienic, they're extremely hygienic. So... Uh, just and, and space saving too. <laughs> and space saving. Uh, and space saving. How much so, do you think cost? Are they like the Japanese toilets? Do you want some space saving? No, these are cheap. Uh, this this one. Well, only one company makes a toilet that's designed for this. It's Coroma, and they're out of Australia. And I believe this toilet is about six hundred or six hundred and fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. Not so expensive, okay. but you. Go ahead. You can buy these little kits yeah. uh, for a hundred bucks, and you can put. That's what I actually have on my house. Is you can put it right on top instead of your tank lid, and that's another method. And that, yeah, so that is, you just take the tank lid off. On the internet, you can buy a replacement lid, which goes right on the back of your tank. It looks just like the tank, <coughs> but it has a little sink, even a soap dish, and it is called Sink Positive. Yeah. Sink positive. <laughs> <laughs> one hundred and ten dollars. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How much is it an ordinary uh, wash your hands in a normal sink take in terms of water compared to this? It sounds like you're doing a full flush worth of water to wash your hands. It sounds like maybe overkill. It's so, overkill. You uh, you will you'll walk away from it. It'll still be filling the tank. So you'll only be washing your hands for whatever three to five gallons or two. Well, actually, either one point two eight. So. Uh, it just depends, uh, but I usually am done washing my hands. Oh, this is too much information. About halfway through the film, <laughs> so uh, it depends how how good a hand washing you are. Don't forget under the nail. <laughs> okay, well we talked a little bit about rebates, uh, and I, this was kind of a plug for Santa Clara Wa uh, Valley Water District, but all sorts of rebates available for this stuff. Uh, take advantage of them. Um, use them as a reason to act now. Uh, I think we already heard about them all. <clears throat> so I'll keep going. I want to talk about rainwater <coughs> catchment just for a moment because it's a rival to gray water often when we're looking at these systems. Uh, we, off, we use them in conjunction with each other, uh, but we also uh, often find when budgets are tight, these are rival systems. So I thought I would just discuss it so that uh, uh, you could look at the pros and cons of rainwater catchment. <clears throat> so rainwater catchment is using storm water, so water that would otherwise not be used at all, so it's not, so it's not using water twice, but it's capturing the water and using it once. Um, it has great benefits to the bay because we tend to, in our, uh, we want a, uh, a, um, a storm water um, uh, award for a rainwater catchment system that we did because, and they were looking at it just from how, how it's affecting the bay. Uh, because when we have, when we develop area, developed area tends to take water, rush it off into the storm drains, carry lots of pollutants directly into the bay. Whereas whenever we can hold water, hold some of this rainwater back and wait, uh, we tend to reduce our impact on the bay and our riparian habitats. So there's great benefits there to storing rainwater. This is one way in a tank underground. Um, rainwater is really clean. It's, it tends to be one of the cleanest sources of water. So it, it also can be used immediately without any treatment for all types of irrigation and other non-potable uses, like filling toilet tanks. Uh, but it tends to be expensive because we're in a Mediterranean climate, so we're storing, at least to store the amount of water you really want to use, and usually you want to use it in the summer, you've got to store it all the way from the winter in large quantities till the, till the summer, and then use it then. So the little rain barrels don't tend to make a lot of, they don't tend to be enough water to make a huge difference 
um, unless you can collect a lot of them together. So you tend to need to, it tends to be a more expensive methodology, but has all sorts of benefits to, to it. <clears throat> And you don't have to store it underground. Uh, you can store it in ponds as well, and that can work really well. This is an interesting system. This is a system that uses rainwater and gray water. So the gray water is first bioremediated bio through a bioswale and treatment, and then it's brought in in addition to the rainwater, keeps, uh, keeps that pond full all year round, this one's at my house, <clears throat> and uh, provides uh, habitat for the Pacific tree frog, a native, native frog of ours, and uh, many other species. Uh, a lot of them, they keep mosquitoes and other pests down, like dragonflies tend to live in this habitat. Uh, great methodology, very simple system, even though it's called a complex gray water system because it's treating the gray water, and, store, and, then, it, and then it stores it, but by the time it's stored, it is not gray water anymore, it's treated water. <clears throat> and then also takes uh, uh, rainwater storage. So you can combine the two systems together. Very clever in living pond, tends to work really well. <clears throat> also want to do a little plug for uh, uh, building ecology. And we're, see and we're seeing more and more use for uh, building ecology, which is taking water, taking, uh, looking at indoor air quality and looking at how we can <clears throat> positively affect it. Because for so many years, what we've been doing is looking at our indoor air as something that we're trying to keep pollutants out. How do we keep bad things out? And we keep running into this trouble that, well, we live there, and we're making the pollutants. So we're using cleaning products, we're breathing, we're, we have pets, we have uh, plastic clothing, we have all sorts of things that are making pollutants on the in indoors we're cooking <clears throat> and indoor ecology is taking a look at how do we take our water use <clears throat> and our plants and we try to create these cycles to create fresh air and clean water together <clears throat> so we're, we're combining the, the uh, aquaponics which is how you take plants and animals together and, and create a cycle fish and plants together and create a cycle, and then we're looking at the humans and the plants, so we're choosing our plants to choose the ones that clean the air the most, and then we're, uh, um, and we're using, using, well, when we do these systems, we're almost always using rainwater or treated gray water for the water source, so they tend to be non-water use. The interesting thing about these systems is they tend to create little higher humidity levels, which tends to increase people's comfort. <clears throat> And interestingly, we see decreased levels of mold, even though you see increased uh, moisture levels, which sounds crazy, I know, but I think it's because you tend to create a more, um, <clears throat> a more competitive environment for different, uh, uh, different molds. So those black molds that we hate so much tend to live in, in an otherwise sterile environment. So this is still in the study, but you find, really you find a reduction in mold levels with these higher moisture levels. <clears throat> well, I think I already went over all this stuff. <clears throat> and you see a lot of health benefits coming out of these indoor air quality issues. You're seeing studies that are showing asthma and respiratory diseases down as much as two weeks a year, uh, from the worst indoor air quality to the best. You're seeing headaches and migraines <coughs> down, depression also, and you're also seeing increased productivity uh, in kids and adults as well. They've done a lot of studies in the office buildings. So that's my plug for indoor ecology. Um, and uh, that's it, so uh, thank you very much. And I'll stick around for any questions after uh, Blake does his uh, I think we have a question in the back. Oh, yes. Two questions, if that's okay. Sure. Can you just tell us a couple of different plants that you know, purify the air? And the second question is, hot tubs, when you unplug them, do they have the Uh, one thing that works for hot tubs uh, that helps really reduce your chemical use is uh, imp 
infrared uh, technology to clean the water. That is a methodology that we've used a lot. The other system that uh, we've, we've used doesn't work with gray water, which is bromine. And so that tends to also work really, really well, but it's a high salt content. And uh, so the most environmentally sensitive ones we use with hot tubs are um, uh, bromine, and then we also use the ultraviolet light in combination to keep the bromine levels down. Um, so I find that to be the be best method. I use an Afuru, so, uh, which you just fill up one time, but I don't use my hot tub every day. I use it every couple weeks. It makes a lot more sense. And then I can use that water for, for uh, gray water use. So that's another method if you don't have one. Yes? The open ponds, does that attract mosquitoes, or how do you keep the mosquitoes down? You definitely have to, or uh, Santa Clara County will be all over you in their vector control program. Uh, so you want to control your mosquitoes. In, this, in that particular example that I, that I gave, um, <clears throat> we use the, uh, so the one thing about so the mosquito fish is the thing that, that Santa Clara County Vector Control always brings around that I could throw in everything. Unfortunately, that's led to a decline in the Pacific tree frog population because they eat the tree frog eggs as well. So what we used in this pond was the uh, snow white mountain minnow, <coughs> uh, which is uh, eats the um, eggs of the uh, um, mosquitoes, but does not eat the frog eggs. So there are other, so, so it's just getting the right species in there. Those things are little fish. They don't get, they're not predated by, uh, by other animals because they're too small and they tend to, they tend to thrive. So that's what we have in this particular pond is the snow white mountain minnow. Yes? Uh, what's the construction of that um, pond? And I assume you have a pump recirculating? No pump. No it's pump. a living pond, but no pump. What kind of material? Uh, that has a, uh, um, a um, uh, it has a pond liner. And uh, I'm trying to think of the material right now. Gunite? It's not gunite. No, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it is like, it's probably a ZPDM, yeah. It's a black pond liner. <clears throat> yes? Uh, what are the plants you're talking about that purify the air? Uh, there's a lot of them, and a lot of them you'll recognize. Uh, Dragonia, um, Boston fern. D it, it is not, uh, it depends on what you're trying to purify. So, uh, uh, Wolferson out of NASA did some great studies in the 80s uh, and we still rely on his original science to choose a lot of these plants. But uh, uh, there's a, uh, a great number of plants, and they each do different things. Uh, and there are plants that are very common. I can help you with a list if you uh, if you want to call me later. But I could, there's 30 or 40 at least. Yes? Well, maybe you can write a little blog post to bring out on that. Yes, I could. Yes, I could. <laughs> but um, my question is regarding the bioremediation. What do you use? Well, we tend to use, uh, we tend to, to <coughs> slow the water down and move it through a swale, typically, and we'll, and we'll put it into a <coughs> sand and gravel bed, and then we'll plant native grasses and rushes in there, so we'll be using root rhizomes, and then usually we'll be ending in a, in a basically in a sandbox, and that sandbox will also be planted, and then the water will filter up through it and then come right over it, all through gravity uh, in a wonderful little system and uh, uh, and super clean and super clean and very very simple and self cleaning. The sand tends to be self cleaning. I would say every what I usually find is every four years or so. It's nice to just scoop them out, start again, take a port, take about a tenth of what you had before, put it back in there to get the biology started, started again, but you do tend to, you get a, silt, a silting that happens over time, uh, but, but uh, maybe four years until you need to do that, so, and it's really, they're, they're not that large. In residential scale, you're talking about two, by, two foot by three feet by less than a foot deep, so it doesn't take much. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes? Do you think it's likely in the near future that California will become a net importer of water? I hope not. I hope we uh, work on our conservation. You know, 
this sort of residential scale, this sort of municipal use is a small amount of our total use. When you start to look at agriculture and in industry, you see bigger problems. But moving water around is a very, very difficult proposition. Um, uh, I don't think that we're going to have uh, um, uh, that we're going to be taking seawater and changing it into fresh water, nor are we going to bring, be bringing fresh water in except for that water that we already bring in from the Colorado anytime soon. But it could go that way. That, that would be a extremely, I'd say before that, what will happen will agriculture will die in our state. And uh, that's the more likely scenario is that we, if, if we get into that kind of danger, because it will be so expensive to try to import the water. Um, but I have no doubt that that this uh, problem is going to become is going to be these problems are going to become uh, of a proportion where these ideas were, are going to be really thought through because uh, because it's really getting very very serious the water problem and uh, it's largely underground still you have to be listening to hear it today but I don't think that's going to be true for very long. <clears throat> Good question.